we're going to treat specifically hamstring tendinosis. The general principle for tendinosis is you want it in a shortened position under contractile load. Is this shortened or lengthened? Lengthened. lengthened. This is shortened, so we're going to put it like this. Now, I've given you that rule, okay, and I'm going to break it today right after we do the first one, right? There's no reason why you couldn't lengthen it and treat it under the contractile load as well, right? So this is where that curiosity comes in, just taking time to go, well, that wasn't as effective. Let's try one other thing and see how that works and go from there, right? So if I walk up the hamstring to a tendon, right? So from a tendinosis, a little bit quick clinically, on tendinosis, what's the, what is tendinosis? Tendon degeneration, perfect. So degeneration usually presents with, it's sore when you first get going, warms up, gets achy while you're on it longer and starts to get sore. That's what degeneration of this tendon does. So when he first gets up in the morning, should it be painful? Yes. Right? Should it warm up and get better? Yes. Does that mean it's gonna be completely pain-free once it warms up? Yes. No, depends on how severe it is, right? If they have pain right where the butt and the hamstring meet, 99.9% .9 of the time you need to have tendinosis of the hamstring tendon on your list. The other thing, whenever you have tendinosis, 99% of the time you're gonna have nerve entrapment associated with it. So you rarely get tendinosis without a nerve entrapment present also, okay? So is it, if, I have, if I find a hamstring tendinosis, am I gonna be looking for a sciatic nerve entrapment or a disc injury? Yes, because those things are there almost all the time, right? Or could they have a post-fem cut or one of those things? You're gonna look for some type of nerve entrapment associated with tendinosis. So that's the clinical side. From the treatment side, we're gonna palpate up to the tendon, find it, okay? Someone's gonna resist here and they're gonna pull in and I'm gonna shoot into that tendon, okay? Make sense? So. Go ahead and pull, Chris. And so you're just gonna be shooting right into here, right? Just like this, we're gonna be walking up and just going all this. And what you're gonna feel is you're gonna feel that ischial tube and that tendon attachment. You're gonna come in and you're gonna bow into it this way. You're gonna come back and bow into it that way. And we're just gonna work all the way around, just like we did with the trochanter, right? All the way around that ischial tube attachment. If you have bone and you have muscle, your tendon should look like dry spaghetti. Good? When you get tendinosis, it starts to look like cooked spaghetti. So if you had cooked spaghetti in a box, right, imagine how poorly that's gonna go in back in that box. But dry spaghetti fits in there nice and clean and tight. So the, the dry spaghetti, the healthy tendon will be narrower than this. It also won't be as boggy because the tissue won't be as just irritated and there's granular tissue that gets in there. So tendinosis, you get a thickened t tissue because it's less organized and then blood flow doesn't go through it, which is the reason why you get the presentation of things are achy when you first get started and kind of wash out once you get going. What's the ultimate risk for tendinosis is that you get a tear. So 98% of tears are preceded by tendinosis. Affecting her hip. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's the other way we treat the hip joint, right? We have troke, we got iliac crest, and we got ischial too. So that's just a twofer. You like twofers. So this goes to, to the anterior side of this thing. This is the next thing we're going to get into. So when we do the next way to treat the tendon, right? And this gets more the adductor side of this because you can get adductor tendinosis as well. Okay. So an adductor is fully lengthened in this position. Okay. So this is actually shortened for the adductor. That's why we're going to do it this way. So this is like an adductor slash hamstring tendinosis. Okay. So if here's the ischial tube here. Okay, we're way down here, and this is what we're pushing. So he's gonna push into my shoulder like a leg press. Go ahead and push. That's what he's gonna do, okay? And we're gonna treat this way into this. So what we're gonna do now is palpate the ischial tube and treat this way. Understanding we have to get that medial edge, which is really close to some anatomy, right? We're really close to uh, tender bits, right? Okay, um, and so we just gotta make sure we're aware of that. So make sure you're palpating. Um, and if it feels easier and less cumbersome to have the narrower head on this, so you don't have the the broadness that comes with the wider head, so you feel like you can get your thumb in there and the wand. Let's go ahead and do the narrower head. 
This one, same thing, about 1.5 to 2.5, right? Anywhere in that range can be appropriate, okay? So essentially, you're, you're gonna palpate. The, yep. So hamstring, this is his ab mag here. Yeah. And so you gotta get all the way into that guy there. Because it's gonna be hamstring, it's gonna be ish tube and um, the pubis. Which is why the ab mag is a hamstring in a. He just said he did? More just for Down more. Yes, there. Go ahead and push into me. You already did the needle side. Go ahead, Andrew. Good? Yeah, go ahead. Is that local or is that going to the hips? Uh, it's going up my leg. It's on my leg. Yeah, that's what yeah. I did to mine too. Even some of the front too. Right there refers to the hip. Into the hip, yeah. We treated the hip joint from the trochanter. We treated the hip joint from the iliacus or the, that's my girl, from the iliac crest. You can also treat the hip joint through that ischial tuberosity. So it's that same thing, but I'm not gonna put someone on their back and try and get all up in their business this way. You're just gonna put them on their side, you're gonna expose that cheek and go directly on that ischial tuberosity, which will give you that same effect. So we talked before about how like sometimes you treat someone on the lateral hip and they feel it deep in their hip, and then sometimes you treat the crest and they feel it deep in their hip or vice versa. It's the same thing with that iliac crest. It's just a different access point to that hip joint. And so when it's useful, it's useful. It's not always useful. Part of the reason why we're not gonna go through how to do it because you understand the concept and it's not one of those things that we're doing in clinic multiple times a day. Yes, sir. So if you're doing a sideline on the greater trochanter and they're not filling in the front, would you just stop and then do try a different position to make them produce the symptoms on the front? The symptoms in the front and deep in the hip joint means that you're accessing the hip joint through what the treatment you're doing. And so if I'm going through the iliac crest and I'm trying to, and I suspect that they have a hip joint pathology and I'm not reproducing hip joint pathology stuff, I may do 100 pulses and then mark it off in my note that said we did in, or, you know, iliac crest, no effect. And so that way when I'm going through my notes later and I come back and I'm like, oh, maybe it'd be a good idea to treat the iliac crest. I'll look at that and I'll be like, no, that didn't work. And so we need to do something different. If you do it in the same visit or not, typically don't. I don't have a good reason to not.